Welcome to the Brainstorm episode 56. We've got Lorenzo back with us to debrief some crazy happenings uh, with Jump Crypto. Lorenzo, can you give us a quick summary of what happened? Was it part of the yen carry trade shock or was this something separate uh, to crypto markets and Jump? Yeah, it's a good question, Sam. So just to give a bit of perspective on Monday the 5th, we had a drawdown of about more than 20%, I think, in Bitcoin and ETH and for the altcoins, um, 30 plus percent across the board. And yeah, I mean, as many of you know, uh, there were a lot of talks of the yen carry trade unwinding. And we had uh, Jump Crypto, which is one of the biggest market makers and algo trading companies in the world and also in crypto. Um, unwinding a pretty sizable position of stake ETH and basically selling more than 300 million, uh, depositing that into exchanges and selling that uh, into stable coins, which was um, extremely, you know, weird, I would say, the, the timing, obviously, uh, of, with that volatility and those prices and, and the, the urgency. Uh, so it was, um, yeah, it was very surprising. And a lot of people in crypto were uh, a bit, a bit, um, yeah, afraid, uh, and also questioning the, the the health basically of jump crypto just in general. And so, what's your take here, right? Why? What, what other reason would there be for them unwinding in in a dramatic way on a day of chaos? Um, is yeah, do you, do you, is this where there's smoke, there's fire, or do you think this is a one off, maybe they got caught off sides on something. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I mean, definitely selling assets on Monday is, you know, you have to, you have to have some kind of urgency. I think the, the, you know, the story with jump trading over the past couple of years, they've taken a lot of hits uh, in general in crypto. Um, I mean, you know, a lot of people alluded to this, but they were extremely involved with the Terra Luna collapse. So when the main, the main market maker of Terra Luna, um, they also were very involved with, with FTX and just the Solana ecosystem in general and took a hit there. They were also, um, you know, developing the Wormhole Bridge, which is a protocol in crypto that was hacked, I think, for $250 million, And they were the ones, you know, uh, plugging the... the um, coming you know, with the capital. Um, and they've also been sued by the CFTC, I think two, month, uh, two months ago, uh, you know, related to, to Terra Luna in general. So you know, it, it hasn't been great for jump trading for the past year and a half. And so, yeah, some people are speculating maybe that they might you know, shut down the crypto division uh, as a whole. I think it's unlikely, uh, but yeah, that's what you know, people uh, were, uh, were speculating. It's been a full week. It is Monday as of this recording. Has it just been silence from the jump team? Have we heard anything about, you know, what exactly was happening last Monday? So we haven't had any official announcement. Actually, it's a good question, but they haven't said anything. I think from what we can see on chain, I mean, they've been going to cash since late July. So it's been like two or three weeks that, you know, they've been selling a lot of the crypto positions. And this is not also, this is one of the reasons it's, uh, you know, it's quite concerning is that these are not like altcoins and very like, you know, risky assets. Those are, you know, it's ETH, like core positions and basically going to USDT or USDC, the cash like positions with, with stable coins. Uh, so there hasn't been any announcement, but, um, but yeah, on-chain data just you know shows us that uh, that they've been going to cash for the past two or three weeks. Hmm. All right, so then maybe just last question here: Are they do they know something the market doesn't, or are they in trouble? Right, when you look at the the crypto bull market that we've been in, you know, are are they just saying, "Hey, this was the run; it's not going where everyone thinks," or you think this is firm specific? Yeah, it's another good question. Yeah, this might be just, you know, them positioning for more downside, just like in, in crypto market and, and prices in general. And, you know, if 
I mean, there are like, if you think about like the next, you know, three to four months in crypto, we still have, you know, Mt. Gox, we still have a lot of, you know, outflows from ETH from the Grayscale, you know, Ethereum trust that needs to be, uh, that we need to go through. Um, and so and you have the elections, uh, you know, now it seems like it's, uh, um, it's way closer between between uh, Trump and Kamala also. So I think there are a lot, a lot of, you know, potential volatility. So it, it could be that they're just positioning themselves, I guess, for more, uh, for a larger uh, drawdown. I still think like selling those assets on, on Monday um, was, was surprising. So the answer is, I don't know. Um, but if you take, you know, what's happened like in the, na- in the past like year and a half, two years for Jump Crypto, it doesn't really paint a good picture, to be honest. Mm-hmm. Gotcha, Lorenzo. Thank you so much for joining us. Maybe maybe someone will make a market on Poly Market, whether they go bust by the end of the year or something, and we can track in in real time. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure it exists already. <laughs> Thanks, guys. See ya. Thank you, Mr. Rights Law himself. You're back at it again with another cost decline this time on electricity pricing in the U.S. Tee it up for us, and then we'll get into it. Sure. Wright's Law states that for every cumulative doubling of production, you get a fixed percent cost decline. You know, just to fill fill everyone in if they haven't been listening for the past uh, 10 years here. Um, But I thought this was particularly interesting. We were discussing all sorts of power and electrical usage needs. This really stemmed out of uh, two lines of work that Daniel McGuire was researching. One, which was uh, nuclear power. And then Frank, Joseph, and I were digging into, you know, the power demand from data centers. And so I was like, hmm, may as well see what the cost decline here is for electricity because is it that critical for data centers uh, from an operating cost perspective? Does it continue to go down? What does that even look like? Uh, and so was able to find and stitch together a number of various data sets. Uh, and since 18, let's see, what year was this? 1893 was the, 93 was the first data point I had. Uh, and it was, you know, I think it was like $8 and something cents per kilowatt hour in 2023 dollars and that cost has steadily come down through 1974 with the exception of world war ii being uh, a momentary blip upwards Uh, and then since 1974 uh, the cost of electricity in the u.s has been quite flat and so then the question here is you know why is that the case um what happened there and we think it is no coincidence that 1974 uh, was the Energy Reorganization Act, which split the Atomic Energy Commission into the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and the Energy Research and Development Administration. And Daniel did amazing work on this, looking at nuclear cost declines. And it's like nuclear rights law coming down, coming down, coming down, 1974, and then prices start going up. And so... It is theoretically possible that killing nuclear in the U.S. uh, stopped the cost declines that we should have experienced. So my first question here is in different areas of the world, there's been different approaches to energy production. Nuclear, are there any countries where you can continue to track this cost decline because they were actually more progressive and less restrictive around nuclear? Or is this a worldwide phenomenon? Yeah, so I think nuclear is also interesting from the cost decline perspective, because normally, say for lithium ion batteries or anything that's more global, you get tech transfer and people leaving one company, joining another. And so there can be a global cost decline curve because that those learnings tend to get shared. Nuclear, given the national security implic- implications there and enriched uranium and all of that, each country does have its own cost decline for nuclear. Um, and so Daniel, again, I'm, I'm quoting Daniel's work here. 
uh, but you can see various countries. Uh, one that we will continue to look at and the country that's still been investing the most has been China. Uh, but, you know, cost data, I think, is a little bit harder to come by there. And so I think the analogy that we were discussing is similar to the space industry here, where it's like in 2005, the cost of a rocket was a fraction of what it was a decade later. And that was because, you know, there's a duopoly essentially for rocket launch. And so cost just ballooned. And then SpaceX came in and they didn't come in at a revolutionary price. They just came in at the price that people were charging a decade earlier. And so there's the potential for this to happen, we think, with nuclear, where, you know, you've had prices skyrocket because people, regulators have been hindering the development and large construction projects are quite difficult. Um, and so now you've got to change in tune from regulators who are now, it seems to be encouraging it. You've got small modular reactors, which in theory should limit the complications that you get with a huge construction project. And so it's possible that someone could come in and the costs of nuclear in, I think this was like in the 1970s was close to like a thousand dollars per kilowatt um, versus what Lazard quotes today, which is over $9,000 per kilowatt, I believe. So that you have this opportunity really to just go back and do what has already been done. And if you can execute on it, get a tremendous cost decline. Is it that you can come in tomorrow and build this for, you know, thousand dollars a kilowatt, or do you need laws and the regulatory stance to change as in, you know, there is a development that goes around maybe some of the guardrails that have been put into place that push out the costs is, are those being taken down or do you need something to happen on the regulatory front before you could actually, like, I, I hear what you're saying. Like in theory, you could build one of these for, a thousand dollars a kilowatt, but it's nine thousand today because of all these regulatory hurdles. Are those still in place, or are they gone? Uh, I would say they're slowly to quickly changing. Um, and so, right now, I'd say they're we're in the company creation stage of these small modular reactors and various nuclear startups, and so all of them are eager because they see this changing tune from regulators and willingness to support these projects as opposed to tie them up uh, in paperwork. And so that's the promising standpoint. You see companies uh, excited by that. So you're getting a lot of people trying different approaches, which is great. Uh, will all of them work? No, but that's that's fine, right? Part of Part of the boom bust of a technology cycle is you get capital coming in. So society wins at large because lots of people are trying different things. And will this happen? Can you just go do it? No. It's like a lot of these companies' projects are planned for 2027 to 2030 as, you know, first build outs. Uh, And so I'd say it still remains to be seen who can execute on this. Um, But in theory, someone who's a ruthless operator should be able to get down to similar costs that we've seen in the past. Uh, will it be on their first plan? I would doubt that. Normally, you know, your first attempt at something is not going to go as smoothly as planned. Uh, but I think that it's reasonable to say that within a decade, uh, it's possible. And why are the projects not slated to start for another two and a half, three years? Are they waiting and hoping? you know, some regime change happens and you have all of these laws that are in place uh, stricken from the record or, you know, no, uh, no, repealed. It, no, no, they're going through the process now. So okay. it's like everyone's getting working to go through the regulators, get approved. And then, you know, it's a construction project. So construction still takes time. Gotcha. Interesting. Yeah. So, And I would say another thing people often ask is about, you know, solar and wind. And we certainly are fans of solar, wind, and batteries. 
those have experienced quite dramatic cost declines themselves. They are intermittent though. And they also have, you know, like utility solar also has a capital cost of around $1,000 per kilowatt. But the difference is, you know, solar can be utilized around 23-ish percent of the time. Nuclear can be utilized 80% plus of the time. And so you get a difference in levelized cost of electricity that's lower for nuclear. Uh, batteries also coming down, right? You pair intermittent solar and wind with batteries and um, that can become more baseload. But right now that's still more expensive. And I understand why it would be intermittent on wind and solar. Why is, I mean, nuclear obviously much higher, but where is that other 20% of time going? Uh, I mean, that's, it can be even higher, right? It, in theory, it should be close 100. to, yeah, but I'm just quoting, you know, the, right now the statistic for, or the base, the, I'd say traditional assumption for nuclear is around 80%. Even, you know, looking at Frank's work for data center uptime around that 80% plus mark, <laughs> just on average across. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Short, so, sweet episode. Keep it, keeping it snappy. Yeah. All right. We'll see everyone next week. All right. See ya. See ya.